The quantum picture of bonding is the ability to understand how get some energy distribution, yeah. one s orbital, one s orbital. That gives you splitting into a bonding state. And then have bonding site state, and we'll have those be occupied. And the way we're going to do that is using uh, a representation called the linear combination of atomic or orbitals. L C A O uh, is sometimes called a tight binding model or TB. Sometimes it's called a tight binding total energy model. E, uh, and there's actually many ways to formulate this, but the same basic approximation holds, and this approximation is that we can write out the wave function of a collection of atoms as a linear sum in one form or another of the orbitals on atoms. So we're, we're basically saying that uh, the wave function is a linear sum of these tightly bound uh, states. And uh, the method that I'm going to show you, uh, this was just kind of following from the, there's a book by Harrison, uh, and he, he goes through a, a, an expression, I think it's kind of a nice, actually, his entire book uses uh, a linear combination of atomic orbitals to talk about uh, the physics of, of materials. He has two books. One is, uh, is called Introduction to Physics of Solids or something like that, and the other is a, uh, uh, just a book on tight binding. Uh, and it's just kind of, what I'm using is kind of a combination of what he did, and then uh, David uh, uh, Pettifor wrote a book also, uh, and, I, and, and Adrian Sutton has a third book. Uh, so I, I'm kind of taking a, a combination of those three to describe what's happening. So let's, let's begin. Let's begin by saying that uh, we have... Uh, two identical atoms that are you know, somewhat near each other, and those two, those two uh, identical atoms each obey the Hamiltonian type expression, like this is I, uh, some eigenvalue problem in which you've got a Hamiltonian describing the uh, electrons around that particular atom. We've got the eigenfunctions for that atom and the energy levels for that atom. And we'll have two of these. So I'm using the subscripts one and two to represent which atom I'm talking about. And I'm saying that these are two identical atoms. Uh, since kind of our first example is going to be the hydrogen uh, molecule. And because they're identical, they're, they have the same functional form, but they're just localized differently. The Hamiltonian is the same, and the, uh, but again, it's localized differently because the potential, remember our potential, v, that V depends on position, so Hamiltonian one will have a kinetic energy of the electron around atom 1 and the potential around atom 1, which means it depends on the local position. Uh, and the eigenvalues that you solve are going to be the same. OK. So if this is what we start with, then our, our assumption is that because these eigenfunctions we know are orthonormal to each other, that they would be a good basis set to describe the total wave function of the system, psi. So we could say that uh, you know we'll approximate 
the uh, states as being a, a superposition of the solutions to the two atoms. Okay, so if we say that's true, then we can say that we've got some Hamiltonian that acts on our uh, wave function. And it returns a set of energy eigen, uh, eigenvalues that are in front of our wave function. Is just our wave function. Okay, so starting from that, what we're going to do is we're going to take, I'll draw a little hat on our Hamiltonian there. Uh, the first thing we're going to do is we're going to take our expression and we're going to hit it on the left uh, by. by one star and integrate. And if we do that, we'll distribute the Hamiltonian through this and we'll distribute the eigenvalues through the uh, parentheses as well. And we'll get something that looks like like that. Okay, well, over here on the right hand side, we know that E and C are just numbers, so you put those in integral, you can pull them out. Same thing on this side. So our right hand side is going to become E C1 integral V1 star V1 plus E C2 integral V1 star V2. Uh, these are orthonormal, one, and we're saying that the uh, 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 that the uh, uh, wave functions on the opposite uh, atoms also are so that goes to zero. So that gives us the uh, right-hand side just being EC1. The left-hand side, uh, C1 will come out. It will leave us with uh, one, well, we'll leave us with this. C1 integral E1 star H1 plus integrals, and at the end of the day, solving the integrals, this is the challenge of this particular method. But each of these integrals has a particular meaning to it. Uh, so for right now, let me call this integral g0, let me call this integral h12. So this gives me the equation. This gives me the equation C1 E0 plus C2 H12 
is equal to E C1. Okay. And if we take, and instead of multiplying by uh, phi 1 star, we multiply by phi 2 star and integrate. Then we get another equation after we step through this, and we get something that looks like C1 H uh, Two one plus C two E zero is equal to E C two. So we've got two equations now that have to be solved simultaneously. Uh, we call these uh, secular equations. And solving these, uh, we solve those by setting up uh, a determinant. We have, uh, change colors back to black. We're going to get E0, H1, 2, H2, 1, E0. C1, C2, C1, C2. Uh, one solution is the, the trivial solution, right? Just saying that the energies coming out are zero, uh, but trivial is boring and we're not doing boring. So the non trivial solution we get by taking the determinant of E0 minus E, H12, H21, E0 minus E equals to zero. And when we take that determinant, we get E0 minus E, E0 minus E minus H. 1, 2, H, 2, 1 is equal to 0. Okay. So let's simplify this a little bit because when we start looking at the meaning of the integrals, the exact functional form of the uh, wave function start becoming important. So let's make the assumption that this is two hydrogen atoms, which means that which means that uh, uh, the I star is equal to the I. If you look at the solution to the hydrogen atom, the radial part of the wave function is all real. So we don't have to uh, think about uh, the complex conjugate. We can get rid of that for the time being. It, it also uh, simplifies some of the symmetry. If you start thinking about p orbitals, you have to start thinking about the x, y, and z directions. Uh, it also means now that uh, so it also now implies that h12 is equal to h21. Right, because the order uh, doesn't matter. And we're going to rename that as equal to beta. Which means that this expression now becomes E0 minus E squared is equal to beta squared, or E is equal to E0 plus or minus beta. That looks familiar, huh? Kind of like a picture we drew at the beginning. Uh, so let's, let's, let's talk a little bit about what uh, these terms mean. So E0. Let's, uh, any, any questions about what we've done so far? We've just been moving things around. Uh, 
those of you who've seen quantum before recognize, you know, this is uh, uh, kets that we're hitting our, our, our system with. Uh, but all of that raw ket notation can be translated into uh, just simple differential equations and uh, integrals. <coughs> which is, is uh, the way that we're, we're approaching this course. Okay, so let's, let's, look at, uh, let's look at E0. E0 is integral H2. Oh, sorry. One. Right, it's the Hamiltonian, and it's the Hamiltonian for uh, uh, the overall system, and these are the orbital wave functions on atom one. So as the Hamiltonian for the total system, we're looking at something that does this. T plus V1 R plus V2 R1. Right? This is the Hamiltonian. We've got the total kinetic energy, uh, which is you know, h bar squared or 2m del squared, and then uh, potential on site 1 and the potential on site 2. And we can collect these terms to give us h1, 1 plus the integral. So what I did is I collected these two terms, T and V1, give me the Hamiltonian on site 1. And we know the Hamiltonian on site 1. H operating on site 1 is just going to be the energy of that atom, right? That's the, the definition that we had over here, right? And that E atom is just a number, so I can pull it out. So that gives me E atom integral psi 1 psi 1, which is 1. So I've got E atom there. Uh, here on the right, uh, this V, this V term is a, and it's an expression that looks, well, Think of it as uh, atom one and atom two and some um, it's just a coulomb coulomb well. So this is B two R where R is our position. Right? And as an operator, it's not operating. It is operating, but it's not operating as much as it's taking derivatives or anything. Uh, it's just present, which means that it can be pulled out. So it will give us uh, two and. Remember, this is the equivalent to the complex conjugate. So that these two can be the charge density as a function of position. So E at zero. How is that different from the previous integral? It's different from the previous integral because we have a V2 in here. And in the previous one, uh, it was just the, the two together. And th so this, this, uh, this E atom is not a function of position, it's just a constant. V2 is a function of position, and we're taking the derivative over all three dimensions. Uh, so this gives us E0 is equal to the energy of the atom plus the integral of the charge on atom 1 as a function of position times the potential around atom 2 as a function 
of position. PR. This term here, and if you do the, the same thing uh, operating uh, uh, phi, one, phi 2, phi 2, then you would get another term which would be the atom plus integral rho 2 r e 1 r dr. And in this particular case, uh, both atoms are the same, so they should be the, the same. But uh, physically, what they're talking about is they're talking about the charge on atom one and its interaction with the potential on atom two. And we call this term uh, the crystal field term. It is basically an expression of how do the energy levels on an atom shift due to the potentials of the atoms that are surrounding that particular atom. So how do the atoms in the field near the atom uh, influence the on-site uh, atomic energy levels. And it, it's actually fairly small, or at least in this approximation we'll say it's small because it allows us to throw it away. Uh, nonetheless, it's something that if you really want to, you can calculate that and include uh, You just need to have an expression for your uh, wave function in order to get the charge density and an expression for the potential. Okay, so that's our E0 term, and then over here we had a beta term here too, right? We have our, our solution was E is equal to E0 plus or minus beta. So let's get beta. Beta is really where, where are the actions at? Uh, but let's... Let's step through it here. Okay. Beta is equal to H12 is equal to H21. Okay? So let's write the integral V1 H V2 is equal to the integral V1 T plus V1 plus V2 V2. Okay? Well, we can take T and V2 in H2 so we can have integral V1 V1 plus H2 V2 Then we can distribute across the across the uh, parentheses to get integral v1 v1 uh, v2 plus integral v1 h2 v2 h2 acting on v2 is just going to give us e2. V2, so we'll have E2 integral V1 V2, and on the right we have uh, that term, so we have integral V1 V1 V2. Okay, this uh, it's called the overlap integral. Uh, it is looking at the overlap between the wave function on 
on site one and the wave function on site two. Now in our previous derivation, we were saying, oh, that's about zero. And roughly it is. Uh, but strictly speaking, you don't have to take it as zero. Uh, if you want to, you can incorporate it here. Uh, and it's oftentimes called S, big S. Uh, seems like that's commonly used in all the textbooks. Uh, but for now, we're going to let this be zero. Because it's going to, uh, well, it's really a minor contribution. And as I said, this is really where the action is. Uh, this is sometimes called the bonding integral. Yeah. Uh, sometimes called the hopping integral. Uh, but the important thing is this is what causes bonding. And there's, there's different reasons people pick these names. Uh, you know, Sutton really likes in his textbook to talk about hopping, where he was taking these linear sums as you hop between sites. Uh, you know, uh, Pettifor called it a bonding integral. I think uh, Harrison also called it bonding. Uh, nonetheless, this is the action. And what this is referring to is it's referring to the integrated interaction between the wave function on site one, its potential on site one, and the wave function on site two. These are the, the three terms in the integral. And that is what describes the degree of bonding. Because it shows up right there. Right? And remember, E0, we said, was the uh, atomic scale levels that are shifted slightly due to the crystal field term. Well, in our case, we're saying that the j equals 1s orbitals. And because these are 1s orbitals, that means the 1 is greater than 0 everywhere. And our potentials are both less than zero everywhere. I, B, I. So what that means is it means that this is positive, positive, negative, beta in this particular case must be less than zero everywhere. Again, this is based on our simplifying assumption that we're dealing with 1s orbitals, and it becomes more complicated otherwise. But we just want to get an idea of how bonding works, and then getting the details, that's a numerical problem that uh, people can work out at home on Friday nights. It's the worst thing to do. Uh, OK, so beta is less than 0. What that means is that now we have energy, we have E0, we have uh, plus beta, beta is less than zero, and uh, well, let's call these both plus beta. beta. This is are bonding, and these are anti-bonding. So we have an expression for our bonding and our anti-bonding sites. Our bonding states, E, B, is equal to E0 uh, plus beta, because beta is less than 0, and E, A, anti-bonding, is equal to E0 
minus beta. Okay, so we've got those, our uh, energy eigenvalues, but that means that we can now solve for our energy eigenfunctions, or in the case of our secular equations, we can solve for the coefficients c1 and c2. And what we find when we substitute those back into the equations that I erased is that substituting EB in yields C1 equal to C2, and substituting in value EA yields C1 is equal to minus C2. And what that means is that going back to our original assumption, which was that psi is equal to C1 P1 plus C2 P2, and remembering that the integral of psi star psi has to be equal to 1, also meaning aka C1 squared plus C2 squared equals 1, right, because that's uh, what you're going to get when you multiply that out, it means that uh, psi bonding is equal to 1 over square root of 2 P1 plus P2, and psi antibonding is equal to 1 over the square root of 2 P1 minus P2. which means that if we take this, it means if we take this and we plot what the charge density looks like, uh, the bonding orbitals, and again, we can do this because uh, we know we're dealing with 1s, we don't have any complex parts. Uh, the bonding will look like Bonding will look like And if we take and we plot the charge density, let's uh, change the colors here. Let's plot the charge density in uh, orange. Look at something that does this. And in the case of the anti-bonding, we'll get a charge density that looks like this. So where we've got bonding, we have charge between atoms, and where we have anti-bonding, we have a node missing charge. And in fact, that charge is getting pushed over to the ed edges.
And, and this is all consistent with what you've seen in your undergrad chemistry class. I don't know if they did type binding uh, integration, but uh, this is where all those fun figures come from. So let, let's write out uh, where these come from. Let's write, uh, I haven't written in purple for a while. Let's write out the charge density. And I will put that over here. squared is equal to d1 plus or minus d2 multiplied by d1 plus or minus d2 is equal to v1 squared plus v2 squared plus or minus 2 v1 v2. So that's equal to the charge on site 1 plus the charge on site 2 plus or minus 2, 2. That is what's causing the change in charge distribution due to bonding. And that is purely a quantum effect, right? This is the interference between the two uh, atomic wave functions that you bring together. And if you want to think of these as, as uh, complex waves, well, there, there's an interference pattern between those. And those can create, that interference pattern can either create an excess of charge or a deficit of charge, just the same way, you know, adding together classical waves, you can get them to uh, uh, increase or decrease their amplitude. And I think that's something, kind of a neat way to think about what we're doing. Uh, any questions about this? I think it's pretty straightforward. Uh, and it looks really straightforward, but when you start sitting down and doing the integrals, it's not so easy. Uh, but nonetheless, it's, it's nice to see where they come from. So what I'd like to do now is I'd like to, uh, yeah, I'd, I'd like to uh, look at some examples in which we, we look at how uh, Using this type of notation, we can talk about uh, the time evolution. And you know, my the example I'm going to show you is, is a little bit it's a little bit hokey because I'm going to say that we can treat the uh, the system as a superposition of being in the bonding and anti-bonding state, which you know is not exactly wrong. But the truth of the matter is, you know, the world's dictated by uh, statistical mechanics. So the distribution is, is really given by uh, uh, the Ausbach principle, but that's okay. This is a, a, a handy way to, to learn about uh, what's happening, and then we'll go back and, and look at a more realistic uh, picture of, of uh, occupying occupying systems. So let, let's let's say that we can uh, write out our solution as a linear combination of, of known solutions for whatever reason. So let's have some uh, capital Psi equal to alpha A, A plus alpha B, alpha B. Now, truth of the matter is, you know, you're probably going to find it in the bonding state, uh, meaning that the coefficient here is one and the anti, uh, the coefficient in front of the anti uh, bonding solution is, is zero. But let's just for now, let's just say we don't know which one it's in. Because I, I want to show how to incorporate time evolution. So let, let, let's say that we don't know which one is in, but we do know that uh, it has to be normalized. Well, if it has to be normalized, then that means alpha A and alpha B have to be uh, one over the square root of two. Uh, so that means that uh, two. Okay, so we got that. Uh, so we can take that, and our solution here is a solution using uh, 
atomic energy levels that were solved using the time independent Hamiltonian. Because remember, the time part and the spatial part can be separated. But we can take our solution and we can put that back into the time uh, dependent Hamiltonian. And what we're going to get is something that looks like this. The function of position and time is equal to 1 over square root of 2 e to the minus i e a over h bar t a plus 1 over square root 2 e minus i e over h bar t b b. So I'm, I'm, I'm using here that uh, omega a is equal to over h bar because, you know, e is equal to h bar omega. Okay, so we got that. So we now have an expression for the time, time evolution. Now let's take and substitute in for the anti-bonding and the bonding V1 minus V2 and V1 plus V2. If you do that and collect the terms, you wind up with something that looks like square root 2, e d minus i omega b t e to the minus i omega a t b 1 plus 1 over square root of 2, e to the minus i omega b t minus e minus i omega a t E2. And we can use, we can use that uh, omega is equal to EA over HA is equal to E0 minus beta over H bar and omega B is equal to E0 plus beta over h bar. Uh, and substitute those back down in here. And again, collecting on the terms. I don't have time, sure. I'll do this one out. You never know how much math to write out in this one term, so. It's kind of nice to see that it isn't that terrible. and then performing a trigonometric substitution, you get So 
Is that intended to be I over root 2? I over root 2, yep. Yeah, and, and I comes about because uh, when you do the uh, uh, trigonometric substitution to get the sine, there's an I sine in the, in the term. But that's okay, it's a wave function, and wave functions are complex, and we can only talk about probabilities or densities. So we have to take the mod squared and the i's go away. And then what this means is this means that if we look at the probability to be in state 1 or in state 2, meaning atom 1 or atom 2, one, as a function of time, it will do this. And the probability to be in state 2, or at atom 2, will do this. Yeah? Um, should, should there also be a 2 that comes out in front of each term? Here, uh... From the identities. Let me see. It probably is. The question is, did I account for it in the math? I H R E squared. Just from like the exponential sum. Yeah, 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 yeah. This term here. There should be a two. Yeah, there should be a two here and a two here. Two I sine. Double check on it, but I'm, I think you're right. There should, should be a, a. I remember the the two i sine is equal to the sum of the exponentials. Uh, okay, but you get something like this. And again, this is a little bit hokey because I'm looking at the probability to find on atom one or atom two, and I'm starting from the assumption that it's in an equal probability of being in the bonding or antibonding states. But what I wanted to show you was it was that. Uh, what's happening, and then what we can do with this type of notation is we can look at time evolution. The time evolution will show us uh, oscillations of the local position of the charge, and what's more, uh, what's controlling the, the frequency of these is beta. And what that means is it means that our, our physical picture is that we're looking at uh, beta is... Uh, This as as we make beta larger, that means that we have more overlap, right? So the integral is an integral of this term, this term, and this term. So to make beta larger means to shift this over a little bit, have more overlap. So we'll have something that does this. So essentially, we're talking about reducing the barrier between the atoms, and this beta is essentially a tunneling of the electron from one atom to the next. And it's going through this small barrier, and the small barrier is determined by that beta integral. So there's, there's a lot of stuff that we can do with this that I, I think is, is kind of neat. Uh, now. I said, you know, it's a little hokey to say it's both in you know, the bonding and antibody states. So let's let's talk about this uh, about what's really happening. And, you know, as long as I'm mentioning this, we're also not accounting for electron-electron interactions, right? This whole premise is that we can just add up uh, wave functions, and, and we know that also is a little bit uh, suspicious. But we get the right uh, physical behavior uh, when we make these somewhat grandiose uh, approximations. So what really happens is that, and this, this is how we think about quantum calculations, is we calculate the states based on you know, what's present in space. You know, you've got some nucleus, you've got some electrons, you throw them in a box, and you get the quantum states out, right? And then which of the states are occupied 
That's determined from statistical mechanics, uh, the uh, Fermi Dirac uh, statistics, and, and, and uh, this alpha bar principle. So we've got H. Polarization, and we have H, H, H2. We basically count up what electrons are available and then we dump them into the lowest available orbitals. Now, if, if we're doing this, uh, we can count up the change in the energy. Okay, so, in this case, our total energy is equal to 2 dB is equal to 2 E0 plus beta. Remember, beta is less than 0. Uh, now, that doesn't help us much. And the reason it doesn't help us much is because in quantum mechanics, we can always set our 0 to be some arbitrary value. Uh, it doesn't really matter what the energy is well be. That's True up until you start, you know, butting up against the, the second law of thermodynamics. But we're not thinking about that. We're just imagining ourselves looking at a, at, at a box of atoms, uh, and that means that two eb doesn't have meaning. But uh, the difference between two uh, h and one h two uh, is significant. So if we have this e tote. B E H two, and we have E H is equal to E zero. Then we get the energy of bonding is equal to uh, E zero plus E. E0 is equal to 2 beta. And, and this is the cohesive energy that tells us the energy to take our molecule and, and rip it apart. Um, and as most of you are familiar, this is why if we replace these hydrogen with helium, you wind up with helium not forming covalent bonds because you basically have a zero change in energy. We've been considering homonuclear bonding of two hydrogen atoms or two lithium atoms that are S valent that are bonded together. But let's let's consider now heteronuclear bonding. But let's let's keep ourselves focused on uh, S uh, valent materials. So think about say hydrogen lithium or hydrogen sodium bonding. And if we do that, we again set up our matrix like this. So it's the same matrix that we have to solve, but now it's slightly different. And, and what makes it different is that in the case of heteronuclear bonding, the on-diagonal terms are not equal to each other, right? Because this is 
you know, say hydrogen and this is lithium or, or what have you. And if, if we take this, uh, so some integral, call this uh, phi i, h e i is equal to e atom i, so the energy of the i atom, plus the charge density on atom i, e j, which is equal to e o i. And in general, e atom 1 is not equal to e atom 2. Okay, so this is, is something we can work with. It's going to change the elements in the matrix. And the off-diagonal terms, uh, those stay the same. So our off-diagonal terms are still this. This is beta, our hopping integral, and this is approximated as zero. Okay, so to solve this, we have to solve the determinant. So we're going to get zero. And uh, I'm going to skip over some of the algebra here uh, because it's, it's uh, a little bit lengthy, and I think that you can see this in, in the notes. But when you step through it, you're going to wind up with minus one half e o one o two. squared is equal to one-fourth e o one squared plus one-fourth e o two squared plus uh, one-half e o one e o two minus E01, E02, plus beta squared, and this becomes then one-fourth E01, oops, minus E02, Beta squared, and we're going to make some substitutions. We're going to substitute here. We're going to substitute for this term epsilon. So this is the average of the atomic energy level for atom one and atom two. And then we're going to substitute uh, this 
delta squared. So let me write that over here. Epsilon is equal to one half e o one plus e o two, and delta is equal to one half e o one minus e o two. And when we do that, this equation simplifies to energy minus epsilon squared is equal to delta squared plus beta squared. And that means that E is equal to epsilon plus or minus the square root of delta squared plus beta squared. Now, what this means pictorially is that We now have the average of the atomic energy levels. Two. That's epsilon, and this is e o one. And when we bring these together, they form bonding and debonding states, right here. Like that. Well, it's not particularly pretty, but like that. this, the beta term is still giving us the degree of splitting. So now this is still giving us the degree of splitting. And then the reason is that if we have our uh, e bonding term, which is epsilon minus square root of delta squared plus beta squared, and we have our anti bonding energy, Ea is equal to epsilon plus square root of delta squared plus beta squared. In both of these, in the limit that Beta goes to zero, uh, Ea goes to E01, and here in the limit that beta goes to zero, Eb goes to E O oh, sorry, E02 here and E01. So this delta and this beta, our definitions, uh, work together to ensure uh, that this beta term is, is what's uh, acting. Okay, so we've got dissimilar energy levels. We still get splitting. Split, splitting is defined by the hopping integral, which is the same integral we saw in the homonuclear uh, case, and we've got this delta term. And we'll, we'll come back to the delta term in a little bit, but right now I want to talk about what's happening to the charge. So what is happening to the coefficients in front of our atomic orbitals? We 
had our, our stepular equation here, and our C1 and C2 in our equations, uh, substituting back in to our matrix uh, the solutions that we have, we find uh, E0, 1 minus E, C1 plus beta C2 is equal to 0, N minus uh, beta C2 is equal to E01 minus E C1. Uh, we can't solve for C1 and C2 exactly, but we can uh, solve for the ratio. So we can find that C2 over C1 squared is equal to E01 minus E over negative beta squared. And using our uh, energy and carrying with us the uh, plus and minus, we're going to get uh, two solutions. Well, let me uh, run through a little bit of the math here and then, then we'll. Well, you know what? I'm going to skip. I'm going to skip some of the math uh, because this is in the notes and I want to get to. The, the physical picture of what's happening. So let me say that in the case of the bonding, we will have C2 over C1 squared bonding state. Uh, is equal to negative 1 over beta squared E01 minus 1 half E01 plus 1 half E02 minus square root of delta squared plus beta squared bonding squared. And the difference between the bonding and the anti-bonding state is uh, to make the anti-bonding state you, you have a, a plus term uh, here. And with a little bit of a little bit of manipulation you can turn this expression into, into uh, right here, C2 over C1 squared is equal to 1 plus 2 delta over beta quantity squared minus 2 delta over beta quantity squared square root of 1 plus beta over delta quantity squared. And get the expression like that. In this, I should mark this here as a minus or plus. So if minus, then it's the bonding. If that's a plus symbol, it's anti bonding. Okay? 
And what this means is that you can take, and we're not going to solve this analytically, but numerically, we can plot Numerically, we can plot C2 over C1 squared versus, versus uh, delta over beta, and we'll get two behaviors. The first behavior Zero. One behavior will do this, and the other will do this. This curve is the bonding state. This is the anti bonding. The anti bonding solution. C2 over C1 squared is always greater than 1, which means that C2 squared is greater than C1 squared. And what that's doing is it's putting charge as you occupy this antibody state, is putting charge preferentially into the state associated with atom 2, which we have as higher energy. Over here, for the bonding state, C2 over C1 squared is always less than 1, which implies that C2 squared is less than C1 squared. So when you're occupying the bonding state, we're creating a superposition in which we're putting charge into the orbital, which is lower in energy. So this, this seems to obey our intuition about what uh, bonding and, and antibonding states do, or what how they physically behave. Uh, so looking at these expressions for energy, I think it's noteworthy that this delta the only difference between the homonuclear and the heteronuclear uh, calculation is really a oh, dead marker. Is really uh, this delta. So the existence of that delta term is what makes the bonds partially ionic. I mean, it's still primarily a covalent type bond because we're talking about uh, integrals of, of uh, wave function overlap and charge sharing, but it's still uh, partially uh, ionic. And in the language of, of uh, you know, polar bonding, we can Express the uh, we can express the, the polarity alpha p as x over one plus x squared to one half. In this case, here I'm going to say x is equal to uh, delta over beta. And in the covalency, alpha c is equal to 1 over 1 plus x squared to the 1 half. And what's, what's nice about this definition is that uh, alpha p plus alpha c squared 
is equal to 1. So we have you know, kind of a quasi-normalization uh, here. Um, and when delta is much, much larger than beta, or you could say when beta you know, goes to 0 relative to uh, delta, Then x goes to infinity, alpha p goes to 1, alpha c goes to 0. And if the reverse is true, if x heads to 0, so beta is much larger than delta, or delta approximately goes to zero, then alpha c goes to one and alpha p goes to zero. And in many other cases, you're going to have some mixture of, of these two. So this is, is kind of a way to express electronegativity. And if you think about electronegativity, uh, you know, there was Pauling's definition of electronegativity, and in fact there are many different definitions. Uh, but Pauling's definition Negativity, the relative electronegativity between two species, the square root of E, E, and B minus one half E, D, A, A minus. So this is the dissociation energy of, in this case, it's an AB bond. So the energy of pull those apart. And this is the dissociation energy of bonds and the B bonds. So we're really talking about uh, how simple is it to pull apart uh, heteronuclear bonds versus homonuclear bonds. And if you think about our definitions, our Dissociation energy for AA and BB. This is coming from E is equal to E zero plus or minus beta. So it really is some beta A, beta B. The overlap, or not overlap, the hopping integrals, those off diagonal terms in our uh, secular equations uh, that define this dissociation. And in the case of our uh, heteronuclear bonds, it really is E equal to epsilon plus or minus square root delta squared plus beta squared. So our dissociation energy is really dependent on delta plus beta. So we can, we can think about uh, electronegativity in terms of 
the integrals that we uh, can write down and, and uh, express. And uh, for the sake of completeness, I just want to mention that uh, you know, there's lots of different electronegativities. Uh, so for example, in, in contrast, we could have, instead of talked about uh, uh, Millikan electronegativities, In that case, the uh, electronegativity of the particular element, so the A element, is written in terms of one half the ionization potential QT and T I I A L minus the uh, Electron affinity. Right? So, this is the energy to strip one electron away from the atom, and this is the energy to add one electron. And because these electronegativity scales are equivalent, so Pauling uh, is equal to 0 0.3. Six molecan minus zero point six one five. It's just a, a linear relationship. That means that our ability to talk about the Pauling electronegativity in terms of these uh, in terms of these integrals allows us to express other complex concepts. Uh, also, in terms of these integrals. And in the notes, I've, I've got a, a plot uh, showing the uh, linear relationship between, between these scales. Let's now move from simple s valent elements and think about how p and d orbitals can be also included. Now, the trick with the p and the d orbitals is that we're no longer dealing with spherically symmetric structures, uh, but now we have uh, uh, directionality, and we also have to think about the fact that the uh, p orbitals are going to have uh, a positive and a negative lobe. So for the sake of making a, a, a definition, we're going to define Y, Z, we're going to find the positive lobe extending in the positive direction. So this would be the PX uh, orbital with the positive lobe in the positive X direction. And then you could have the, uh, the y orbital, orange, in the positive y direction, and uh, the positive z orbital in the positive z direction. And that's going to be the convention that we use. It doesn't have to be that way. There's nothing that, that requires it this way. And in fact, solving the math always comes out the same. As long as throughout your calculation, you define a consistent uh, nomenclature and you, you stay with it, the, the negative signs will all track through and, and come out correctly. But just for the sake of having these notes, let, let's do it this way. Okay, so we've got uh, this definition, and let's just think about sp valent. Uh, if you think about sp valent, we again have secular equations, and the on-diagonal terms are not going to change. 
So the on-diagonal terms in which you have uh, the orbitals interacting with themselves. So for example, you have some integral that does px star h px. And again, notice that I'm bringing back the, uh, the complex conjugates. We have to take that into account now that we are uh, including uh, non-s orbitals. Well, this is going to be equal to the energy of the px orbital plus crystal field. The off-diagonal elements, though, are going to be a little bit more complex. So remember when we started, right, we were talking about uh, integral S1, B2, S2, and we said, oh, well, in this case, we had uh, you know, the potential on site to the uh, S orbital on site to, and then some orbital on S1, and integrating this, uh, we said that uh, this is positive, this is positive, this is negative, so beta had to be uh, less than zero, uh, just by, by the definition, and we got out beta star is equal to beta. And that's because these were all real terms. That's now changed, and what's really changed here is that, that now our picture, our picture of, of uh, you know, integrating this this versus the integral of this, 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 these two integrals are not equal. And that's because here we're talking about a positive s orbital interacting with a negative uh, p orbital. And here we have a positive s orbital and a positive p orbital. So we have to take into account the directionality of which atoms on the left, which is on the right. And again, you know, the choice of sign is all going to work out the same as long as you uh, the final solution will always work out the same as long as you stay consistent from the beginning. And we're defining our, our positive uh, x direction uh, in the positive orbital. It's also worth noting that if we have this, and this is kind of our uh, you know sp sigma bond, right? Well, what if we have something that looks like this? integral of this. This integral, it's not very well, but uh, this integral has to be zero. And the reason it's zero is because by symmetry, by symmetry, you have part of the integral where you have plus and minus, and part of the integral, where it's plus and plus, and those two add up to zero. So the good news is here, we're going to get a bunch of these uh, terms that go to zero uh, based on the symmetry of the orbitals. So let's, let's write out what the matrix would be if we had If we had uh, a uh, S valent and a SP valent uh, atom bonding to each other, so let's say we've got some, uh, you know, 
S valent. It's an SP valent. So here we've got an S orbital, a P, a P, and a P. And let's define this as the plus x direction. Okay? Well, if we have this, we can write out our you know, hypothetical wave function as a linear combination of atomic orbitals. Right? This is the, the basis of our general approach. So psi would be equal to C1s phi1s plus C2s phi2s plus C2px phi 2 px plus c 2 py phi 2 py plus c 2 pz phi 2 pz okay so the uh, orbitals associated with the uh, atom number two and atom number one is just the 1s or just the s orbital so the one corresponds to the atom number. So one s is the s orbital on atom one. C two s v two s is the s orbital on atom number two. It's it's not the uh, uh, it's not the uh, uh, principal quantum number, but the, the atom number. And I'm going to jump in. I'm going to give you the matrix, and then we'll go through and, and look at what each of these terms will be. So our matrix that we need to diagonalize, well, actually it's before the diagonalization, but it's the, uh, the, the matrix in our uh, uh, set of secular equations. And remember, we get those from hitting the left side by the complex conjugate of each of the orbitals and then integrating. Uh, doing that, we get I'm just going to make this out as a grid to guide the eyes. Okay, so that's what we're at. And we will get terms that look like, oh, sorry, there's stars here because our, our rows are the complex conjugates that we hit this equation with and integrated. E S one, E S two, E P. E P two, E P two, E P two. Sigma S S, Sigma S S star, Sigma P S star, Sigma P S, and a whole bunch of zeros, which everyone should be jumping up and down with joy for because zeros are great. And all of these zeros come about by symmetry. Uh, so understanding how the symmetry works uh, will make your life much easier. So let's, let's, let's talk about what these terms mean. Okay. Well, first let's talk about the on-diagonal terms. I've got Three values, and those 
are going to simply be V1S, H, V1S, VS1, V2S, oh, sorry, there's an asterisk there. And integral B P J H J two. It's just the on-site energies, and, and that that makes sense. So this is a J J equals one. Uh, sorry, is equal to X Y or Z. Okay, that makes sense. Now let's take off diagonal terms and uh, let's take this SS term, sigma SS, that is the integral V1S star h v 2 s and if we take the uh, complex conjugate this is sigma s s star is equal to the integral of E to S star H V one S. And uh, similarly, I'm going to change colors again. Went to PS star, sigma PS and sigma PS star. Uh, integral sigma 1S star H sigma 2 PX sigma 2 sigma PS. And again, this is something that uh, we are defining the sign and uh, we've defined that this integral this integral with the plus s and the minus p uh, node or not the minus p uh, uh, lobe uh, this is defined as plus sigma ps, and that's, again, just something that you have to be consistent throughout your calculation, and as long as you're consistent, it works out. Uh, so here, I'm defining this as uh, plus ps, and then that means that the integral v to px star h v 1s equal to sigma p s star. Uh, and remember, I, I showed you that uh, Hermitian uh, algebra. And in that Hermitian algebra, we had uh, right over here that the integral of some wave function star uh, Hermitian operator V is equal to integral of uh, V star H psi star. Well, this is this. So uh, we're seeing this uh, same algebra come back a second time. Okay. Um, 
And then we've got all the zeros. And uh, the zeros come about, pick uh, purple here for that. Zeros. Uh, and the zeros come about for all the terms that look, well, part of them are, are the terms where you get the summation going to zero because of symmetry. And, and part of them are terms in which we have uh, one, symmetry, and two, they're coming about from terms that look like this. 2s h v 2 p x is equal to integral v 2s e p v 2 p x, right? So uh, we know that Hamiltonian will give us something that looks like that, and you know we let the uh, we let the uh, uh, we let the uh, that s integral go to zero, and in this again we get e p integral v two s v two p, and this is equal to zero by definition because of uh, the on-site. Uh, the on-site um, the on on-site uh, 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 atomic wave functions are by definition orthonormal. Uh, so this is this is where our, our matrix comes from, and if we write this out, we'll have something that looks like lazy here. And if you could overlook those uh, uh, the lines, uh, we'll have something that looks like this. C1S, C2S, C2P, X, C2P, Y, C2P, Z is equal to the eigenvalue times C1, S, C2S, C2P, X, C two P Y C two P C, and now it's, we just have to solve uh, the determinant, and we're not going to do that. That that's something that uh, is going to be messy, sort of. It's it's messy, uh, but we do have some things that make our lives simpler, and and most notably. We have a matrix which is in block diagonal form. And by block diagonal form, I mean that we have a block here, and a block here, and a block here. And all the rest are zeros. And the definition of the block diagonal is that when we diagonalize them, we can separate these out. Now, again, I'm not going to numerically solve these, or analytically solve them, but I do want to point out the consequence of, of this block, block diagonal form. Uh, one consequence is that uh, one solution Uh, to this is going to be e is equal to e p two. That's going to be the eigenvalue 
and it's going to have the eigenvector 0, 0, 0, 1, 0. Another solution will be E equals E P2 with eigenvector 0, 0, 0, 0, 1. And then the last solution is going to be found by diagonalizing E S one sigma S S sigma P S sigma S S star E S two zero zero sigma P S star E P two C one S C two S C two P X C one S C two S C two P X and the solution to this is going to give us uh, what's happening in the bonding and what's happening is mixing the orbitals, right? This is the basis of hybridization. So if we talk about the hybridization of bonds, what we're really talking about is writing out this matrix and getting uh, sub-blocks of this matrix which hybridize. So this is going to be hybridization of the S and the P orbital. And over here, these two solutions are p orbitals that don't mix. So, again, you know, solving this really does require getting an idea of what these integrals are and having a good input. Uh, but I'm hoping you can see uh, how to go about this. Now, let's let's look at uh, how to further extend this model to talk about uh, p orbitals interacting with each other. So if I wanted to take this and I wanted to talk about instead of a s valent and an sp valent uh, set of atoms, I wanted to talk about a sp valent and an sp valent bonding to each other. Now I'm going to wind up with not just sigma bonds, but I'll wind up with other bonds as well, dealing with the p orbitals seeing each other. And Again, the on-diagonal terms are not going to be that challenging. It's going to be the same as we just saw. But now the off-diagonal terms, there will be, uh, well, first off, it'll be a larger matrix. Because instead of having uh, S, S, and 3Ps, it will be S, P, S, P. So our matrix will now be a 4, 8, it'll be 8 by 8, uh, which means it's going to be a lot more work. To, uh, to write it out and to solve it, uh, and then filling these out, uh, the off-diagonal terms in which you have integrals that look like this, or this, Those are going to be equal to zero, and it's going to be for the same reason that the s orbital coming in to this configuration is zero, because you know, here that positive orbital and that negative will interact, and that positive and positive will interact, and the net sum will be zero by symmetry. Um, and then integrals that look like this.
that. This is positive times positive, negative times negative, positive. Uh, and a negative, this integral is going to be less than zero. And uh, you, know, you can refer to this as a uh, uh, you know, pi pp, because we were referring to our sigma ss before, or sigma sp. Well, that's going to be a, a pi bond. Uh, if we have something that does this, and I don't know if you're ever going to see this, because I think by definition you won't, but that, that's zero, again, because plus and the minus are going to cancel each other out. And lastly, so I'm just going to take that out because that doesn't really make any sense in terms of how we're drawing things. And lastly, we have something that looks like this. Well, and in this case, we have a negative, we have a negative and a positive, it's going to be negative. This is larger than zero, and this is going to be a sigma p p. Now, this situation uh, works really well when you have uh, you know, just dimers. If you want to start thinking about more complex molecules, you can still apply this technique, and, and people do. Uh, but there's a couple elements that you have to start thinking about. Well, one is, is that a lot of these integrals are basically going to go to zero if, for example, you've got, you know, making some structure like this, right? Well, I can certainly imagine there being interaction here and interaction here, but here my integrals are going to go to zero. So you can simplify things a great deal by, by simply defining, oh, it has to be within a certain distance, uh, otherwise I'm not, I'm not going to bother with the integral. Also worth noting that now we have geometries that are going to have some angular dependence, right? If, if we define this as our you know, positive x direction, well, now all of a sudden uh, that changes, right? So let's uh, make this out. I've got some. Uh, positive s and positive negative, uh, what I can do is I can take the projection of the p orbital uh, into the different directions. So I can take and I can rewrite this as I can rewrite this as So this term would be cosine theta sigma sp, and this term would be zero. So you can uh, define your uh, 
projections using uh, just simple trigonometric relationships. And you know, in a similar fashion, you would have Theta we have a So here, we would have to project both of the uh, p orbitals into the plane. And in this case, we have uh, cosine squared uh, theta times uh, sigma p p plus sine squared theta pi p p. So this, this uh, tight binding method, you'll see this in, in literature. Uh, people have tried building on this as, as a means of uh, creating a mathematically useful uh, approach. Um, Harrison has a book in which he uses it to explain bonding. Uh, I don't think that his numbers are quantitatively exactly right, but he gets a lot of mileage out of uh, explaining bonding. Uh, the, the group that I've seen doing the most work, and again, this was you know, 10, 15 years ago, because uh, I think that this is not a particular pop, particularly popular approach anymore, but uh, the group out of the uh, uh, Naval Research Lab by uh, Mel and Papa Constantopoulos. Mel and Papa Constantopoulos, uh, they've developed a technique to, uh, to do this work uh, that was I would say numerically very clever. Uh, and the real part of their work that I thought was what gave it legs was that they defined the integrals uh, in terms of uh, had these functional forms. And then they would go back and based on data, they would back determine what the functional forms of the uh, integrals would be. And then once they had that from data, that would allow them to take the model and to, to move the atoms around and look at how the electronic structure would be modified. I think the most recent paper they wrote on this, they were looking at uh, magnesium diboride. This, this must have been, this must have been uh, maybe eight, nine years ago. So this is uh, a, a quantum picture of bonding. 